Playlock. Can't imagine what it would have been like to be a shepherd who got to hear the first glad tidings, the first announcement. And I want us to think about Christmas in a different way. But how many of you like Christmas movies? Yeah, a lot of you. Well, we just, uh, at our staff Christmas party, we played Christmas movie trivia. Um, There were only about three people playing and the rest of us were just listening. Because frankly, I flunked out on it completely. (laughs) But I was thinking about Christmas movies. Either you think, well, I watched that one, I'm I'm over it. Or maybe there are ones that are those favorites that you watch every Christmas and you re-experience, even though you know exactly what's going to happen, but it's the experience. And I thought, similarly, when we come to Christmas, uh, I'm probably not going to tell you anything about the shepherds you haven't already read. And if I do, you should be kind of skeptical because I'm making it up. (laughs) But we want to go back like a favorite story and re-experience it and apply it and think through the implications of it. And particularly, how do we learn from the Christmas story things that are relevant to what we are experiencing right now? So I want us to take a moment and to look back at what an unlikely setting it was that Jesus came into, that Jesus, who was the king of glory, Jesus, who was enthroned in heaven, Jesus, who spoke and the universe was created, that when he came to earth, he came not to the top of the pile in earth, but to the very bottom. And I want to just read to you, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 2, or if you have the Bible app, you can just open that up and we'll be there. And I want to just to read it to you, and if you can read along, or if you want to just listen. And I want you to ask God to make it fresh and new again for you, instead of, oh yeah, I already know that. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths, and she placed him in a manger, 
because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and had gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. In the midst of this unlikely setting, Jesus, the King of glory, Jesus, fully God, emptied himself and was welded to a human form. And not only that, his first announcement, the announcement of a royal birth, was to shepherds. Now, let me back up just a little bit and even talk about how more this was an unlikely scenario. It says in the first day, in the first verse, in the days of Caesar Augustus, he issued a decree that the census should be taken of the entire Roman world. That, that starts off to set us where we are in time, but you may not have an appreciation for the fact that there was a huge gap between the last time God had entered in to speak through one of his prophets to the people of Israel. In fact, it had been 400 years. And 400 years before Christ, the last of the Old Testament prophets was a guy named Malachi. And at the very end of his book, it says, but as for you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Sometimes people call these the silent years. I don't, I don't really think that's a good term. That means we don't have any revelation from that period of time that was written down as scripture. But if those were the silent years, then it's been silent for the last couple thousand years as well. It doesn't mean God wasn't working. But listen to this. He was working in ways that were unlikely, at least to their expectations. So Malachi declares that the son of righteousness will come. And then the Greeks under Alexander the Great expanded their empire and they took over all of the known world. And it was a period of time, Alexander the Great died and he left his empire to the four of his generals. And Israel was ruled by one of those generals. And finally, in 163, some Jewish men named the Maccabeans, that was their family name, they rose up and they led a rebellion. And, and for a period of time, they had their own kingdom and their own, and they were following the, the, the Old Testament scriptures. And then in 63, the might of the Roman army reached to Palestine and they march in and they take over in a great bloodbath. In fact, they appointed a guy named Herod the Great. Uh, I think he probably named himself, if you know anything about his history. And it took him another 30 years to conquer his own capital city. He had to actually set up siege engines to, to get his own way into the capital city. So they were a dominated people. And you realize that all this time, they were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for God to move. They were waiting for something to happen. And it seemed like nothing that they wanted to happen was happening. And yet, if you understand what God is doing, you realize that the Greeks brought the Greek language that spread over the whole world so that when the New Testament was written in Greek, it was the language that could be spread over the whole world. 
And you realize that when the Maccabean independence, it gave them not only a hope that they could have their own kingdom, but that's where the Sanhedrin was set up. That was where the, the people who had pulled together to try to obey the Old Testament scriptures, and ultimately they would decide whether Jesus was the Messiah or not. And the Romans, when they weren't fighting wars, were building roads. And one of the greatest contributions they made was the roads that allowed the Apostle Paul to go all over and the, the Roman peace, they called it, where you were not subject to bandits that would attack you on the road. The, the Romans kept the peace. And Herod the Great, appointed by the Romans, was the one who built the temple. And it was a place where they come back to, to sacrifice and to worship. It was a place where Jesus came as a Jewish man to worship God. And, and I say that not just to give you a history lesson, but I believe that God was preparing the way. In Galatians 4, it says, in the fullness of time, Jesus was born. In the fullness of time, when God had the stage set, when everything was ready, not to the people who were maybe living there experiencing it, but in God's much bigger plan. And I want to pause just for a moment to ask you exactly that same question. In your life, you're often waiting for God to do something. You're waiting for an answer to prayer. You're waiting for a relational situation to get fixed. You're waiting for somebody to understand. You're waiting for God to do something in you. And the good news out of this story is that even when you can't see it, God is working. And sometimes he's working on a lot larger scale than your individual needs. And he's moving things and people and places to make it come together so that he can do what he's doing. And we, whether we admit it or not, would like for God to be our servant. We want God to listen to us. We think that prayer is like dictation. And God is doing his own thing, and he is working all things together for our good, but ultimately for his glory. And so, to those of you who are in this time frame where you're thinking, yeah, my life isn't what I want it to be right now. I would encourage you to keep following Christ closely, but also to trust that God is at work even when you can't see him. And then in this time of your life, you might come back and say, okay, God, I'm gonna put it back in your hands again. I'm gonna trust you that even if I can't see it, I know that you are to be trusted. And honestly, we need to get a little less self-centered. God, you're working your plan and I'm willing to fit into your plan instead of hoping that you'll make my plan work. Because we have a great tendency to really want to be competition for God. We want to control things and make things work like we want them to. So God was arranging things in his way. And then here's this amazing moment where it says Jesus is born and he has already moved in Joseph and Mary individually. And then he's moved them together because of this census down to a town that was probably about 50 miles from where they were living in Nazareth. And they came down to this little town in Bethlehem, named Bethlehem, which was from the, the line of David, where the people who lived there. That was David's town. That was where he was born. That's where his family was from. And hundreds of years before this, in the prophet Micah, God had said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. I wonder if every pregnant woman in Bethlehem for hundreds of years had wondered if this is the one. And then he imports somebody from outside. And God is working all things together. And then he announces it to a group that would be unexpected. If you were to go to Bethlehem today, there are still shepherd's fields outside of Bethlehem. And when we think in Douglas County fields, we're thinking nice, flat, lots of grass. They're thinking there's about equal amount grass and rock. And it's often terraced, and the sheep just go all over it, and sometimes they're grazing in what we would think of as desert. And you're wondering if they eat rocks, but this is what they call the shepherd's fields. And all around the shepherd's fields, as there is in many other places in Israel, there are all kinds of limestone caves. And limestone melts away with rainwater, and it makes all of these different caves and this particular cave is right outside that, what they call the shepherd's fields in Bethlehem, which is right outside of town. And if you can go in them, you can see the black on the roof from campfires 
from hundreds of years where people would live there, shepherds would stay there. And when it says they were living in the fields, you and I probably think of a nylon tent sleeping on a sleeping bag. And they're probably hanging out by a fire in the little overhang or the cave. And this cave has actually been made into a chapel. And you can go there and spend some time just worshiping and reflecting. But the point of the story is that God announced this most epic event where Jesus, who was fully God, would become fully man. And he announced it to a bunch of nobodies. He announced it to the shepherds. The shepherds were a relatively uneducated group. You know, it had used to be in David's day when, you know, the shepherds at least had some good credibility. But as a city gets settled, then the shepherds are the ones that are still itinerant. In fact, I don't know if you read this. We always read it with a... uh, a modern overlay, but it says they were living in the fields. That means they were homeless, right? They're following the sheep around. They're living in caves. They were uneducated, probably smelled like sheep. And if you've raised sheep or been around sheep, you know that's not a compliment. In fact, the interesting part is the sheep that they raised were probably the sheep that were used for the sacrifices in Jerusalem. So there would be sheep near Bethlehem year-round because people would come from out of town and they needed to be there and you couldn't necessarily bring your sheep with you so you would come with your money and you would buy a local sheep so that you could be a part of the, the worship of God and the sacrifice. And I read an interesting source that said because of the shepherd's lifestyle and because of them handling animals and often dealing with dead animals or fighting live animals, that they were often unclean and could not participate in the very part of worship that they were helping prepare. So by almost every measure, the shepherds were on the outside of everything. They were not the cream of society. They were the kind of bottom tier. And the beautiful thing is that God comes to them. He sends an angel. And the angel says, it says, the angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And as it always says when angels show up, they were terrified. Now, I believe in angels, but if an angel appeared to me, it would rewrite my theology, I'm pretty sure. (laughs) Because all of a sudden, that which we believe sort of philosophically was all of a sudden right in their face. And it says they were terrified. And the angel just starts telling them some incredible news. The angel said to them, don't be afraid, I bring you good news. That's the word we use for the gospel. That's the the story of Jesus and how he brings salvation. And it will cause great joy for all the people. Not just the rich, not just the intelligent, not just the religious, but all the people. That, That God brought the news of this good salvation he was bringing and he brought it to the ordinary. To me, that's a very encouraging thing. It doesn't mean you have to have so many moral brownie points for God to care about you. It doesn't mean that you have to have so much education or so much religion. It means that God literally started his ministry by caring for the down and out. And that was a picture of the humility of Jesus, that he not only came to earth, he came to be welded to a human body, but he came to the lowest. And God was preparing a truth that was going to impact all the people. And through the first years of the church, often the people who were followers of Jesus were those who were slaves, those who were disenfranchised, those who were on the fringes. And they eventually became a mighty church that God began to use to change the world. But that's good news for you and me. God came to people just like Douglas County. God came to people who didn't have a whole lot of credentials compared to the world. He came to ordinary people, just like you and me. And you think that the king of glory could have been announced by all kinds of heads of states. If you were royalty, you can hardly burp without it being on the front page. And when a royal child is born, envoys are sent from all the nations around and exactly as like it was in Jesus' day. And what did Jesus do? He was announced, he was born in a 
stable, he was placed in a manger, and he was announced to shepherds. And that talks about how far he lowered himself to become our salvation. When I was a kid, I thought a manger was a pretty cool little thing that they used for little babies. When you go to Israel, you find out they are stone feeding troughs for animals. And it was a handy place to stick a baby. And he was probably in another cave in Bethlehem just a short ways away. And I want us to look at what the angel said. He says this, news that I'm giving you will bring great joy for all the people. And I want to just drill down for a moment on what it is that the angel said to them because really the angel gave him an unbelievable message to an unlikely setting and he yet gave them all of the principal pieces that you and I need to worship God about on Christmas. He said, today in the town of David there is a great gift that God is a generous God. He's a giver of gifts and this gift was the Son of God. He said, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. You see, Philippians 2 talks about that God, who was enthroned in heaven, fully God, he lowered himself. Or the the literal word is that Jesus emptied himself. That he came and was welded to become 100% God and 100% human. And because he was human, he experienced all the difficulties of human life, all the temptations, all the struggles. And Hebrews says that's why he can be such a great high priest because he's empathetic, he sympathizes with us. When you pray to God, he understands what it is you're experiencing, what you're going through. And he lowered himself and became One who had filled the universe lowered himself to becoming a single cell. And then he grew up and he was a helpless baby. And yet he was fully God. You say, how can that work? Well, one of the very, you know, rude illustrations of that is if you were to blindfold yourself, you would still have eyes, you could still see, but you were not seeing. If you had your hands tied behind your back, you still have arms, but you're not using them. If your feet were hobbled, you would, you would be able to still walk, but you wouldn't be able to use your walking. And that Jesus, it says, emptied himself and became one of us. He quit using all of his powers as God, and he came and humbled himself to experience life with us. And because he did that, he was able to be our savior You see, the first word that he uses, he says, a savior has been born to you. And the word savior, you know, we think of the mindset of the Jewish people at the time. They were being oppressed by the Romans. They were in poverty. They were dealing with all kinds of internal political conflict. And when you said to a Jewish person, he will save you, they would have thought, he's going to come and kick out these pesky Romans and restore us to our glory as a kingdom. But in Matthew, the angel says to Joseph, you are to name him Jesus. And Jesus means, it's the Hebrew word Yeshua, and it means salvation of Jehovah. You're to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. You see, we often want God to save us from our circumstances because we don't realize how deadly the problem with sin is. And Jesus came to save us from our sins so that we could have a relationship with God, so that we could be with him forever. He is our savior, and he came to provide salvation for us. And that talks about his mission. And then it says, he is also the Messiah. The Messiah was a Jewish word that means the anointed one. And when a king came into his kingship, his coronation, he had oil poured on his head, or a priest would have oil poured on their head, and they were anointed, and it was the symbol of you're now taking this office, and you have all of the responsibilities and rights of that position. And then all the way through the Old Testament, there was this thread of one day the anointed one will come, and he will reign with righteousness, and there's all kinds of prophecies about the Messiah. And Jesus came, 
And he fulfilled all of those prophecies, including where he was born, and that both Joseph and Mary were from the line of David, and that all of God's promises, there is only one person that could ever fulfill all of those promises. And that's Jesus. And the Greek word for the Messiah is what? A little Bible test? It's the Christ. Christ means the anointed one. So Jesus is what his friends would have called him when they were playing kickball in the streets of Nazareth. That was his personal name. The Christ was the title, the Messiah. And that talked about his history and the promises of God and the things that he was fulfilling. And then he said, and he is also the Lord. You see, that talks about not only who he is in very nature, but it also talks about his future. That in Philippians 2, it says that he lowered himself down, 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 finally to death and then to death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him so that he is above every name that has been named. Amen. That he is the Lord. In fact, I'd not noticed it till I read through it this week. The shepherds said, after they heard this message, they said, we need to go see what the Lord has told us. You see, they used the term the Lord for God, the Father, and Jesus was also proclaimed the Lord. So he is the Savior, he is the Messiah, and he is the Lord. All of that incredible, important truth was given to a bunch of shepherds. And you know why I think we have such a great, exact story about this? It's because it's in the book of Luke. And Luke was a scholar, but he was also a reporter. And he says he went back and carefully researched it. And I think he went to visit some people. And I think he found an old shepherd whose life had been absolutely changed by one night when the angels appeared to them. And I think he got the blow by blow because he talked to somebody who'd been there. And don't you imagine their lives would never have been the same? That they got to hear, they got to see, they got to experience. And why did they get to do that? There was no good reason except that God was giving his incredible truth to a bunch of extremely ordinary people, as he does with us day in and day out. So that was the message, and then there was a great response on the part of the shepherds. There was an uninhibited response. First, it says they were terrified, as you can imagine they would be. They were, they kind of came into this gradually. It started with one angel, and then, man, it blew their mind. There was a whole host And I think you and I don't realize the invisible world that's around us all the time. We only see the spiritual battle as it comes out in physical realities. But there was a reality that they got got to see. And it says, when the angels had left them and gone back into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger Their immediate response is, let's go see. Let's check this out. What what else would make sense? You get this incredible news. They're right next door. They're in the fields right outside Bethlehem. Somebody said to me, when all those angels appeared, do you think they could see it in Bethlehem? I think so. This was fireworks, and everybody's watching, and it's a dark night, and all of a sudden, they see, but they get to hear the message. And so... They say, let's go see. I don't know if you think about this in real terms, but can you imagine going around the middle of the night saying, is there a baby here? Is there a baby here? And uh, if you've ever been around the birthing process, it's not quiet. So I imagine people knew where that baby had been born. Yeah, it's in the cave over there. And it says they went and they found everything exactly as they'd been told, that there was a baby wrapped in claws, lying in a manger, born that night, And there was only one that would fit that description. And I love that little film clip that we played because it shows Joseph and Mary kind of in a private moment with their baby. And all of a sudden, these smelly, rough-hewn, you know, (laughs) pastoral hooligans come around your brand new baby. And I know how moms are with first babies. And you don't want anybody touching your baby that hasn't washed four times. And I don't think the shepherds washed their hands on the way there. But you know what it says? It says Mary treasured all these things in her heart. 
Why? Because they knew the message that both Joseph and Mary had received, and now the baby was born, and God was affirming what he was doing through the shepherds. You see, they said, let's go see. And then they said, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. When there was a royal birth, there would be heralds that would go and tell the message to every kingdom around. And these were Jesus' royal heralds. It was a bunch of shepherds. And it said they told with great enthusiasm. It says they went and they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. You see, not only did they say, let's go and see, but when they saw, they said, let's go tell others. It's the same responsibility we have today. You and I are nothing special, but we've been given something special. We have been allowed to know a truth. We've been given light in the darkness. We have been given a a celebration of eternal life. And the responsibility that we have is to not hold it in. Don't put our light under the the bushel basket. And it says they went and they told with enthusiasm. And you know what? I'll bet they got the same response we get today. Some people respond with joy and they want to know more. Some people react as eventually the king would do as Herod wanted to try to kill the baby. Stop that because Jesus was going to ruin his plans. And I'll warn you, Jesus will ruin your plans. He will take your selfish plans and set them aside because he has a bigger and a better plan. And so they went to tell And then it says, the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. You see, it was truth. And the truth was that after they had seen and after they had told, they spent some time praising God. And in a holiday season, it's easy for you and I to be complaining. And you know what? There are always enough things to complain about. And there are always enough things to praise God about. I remember years ago, I went to a pastor that was here in town, and I said, how's it going, Wes? And he said, it's a mixed bag. And I thought, those are prophetic words. (laughs) There's always things in our life that we can rejoice and praise God about. And there are always things in our life that we can grumble and gripe about. And listen, if you don't respond to the things that God is doing as you should respond, then you will never be who God wants you to be. You can choose to look at what God is doing and praise Him and lift Him up and give Him glory and give Him appreciation. Or you can choose to look at what's not like you want it to be. And you can be frustrated and irritated and you can be focused on your will instead of God's will. But there's always a reason for joy. And there's always reason for complaining. You choose. It's a choice that we make. What am I going to focus on? What am I going to pay attention to? What am I going to let my heart and my mind be captivated with? And I I heard a great phrase this week. It says, the difference between entitlement and privileges is gratitude. And I would add the difference is also generosity. Generosity that when I see that all God has given to me, I can be praising him and lifting God up and rejoicing in what is good. And that moves me not only to gratitude, but to generosity. Or I can be complaining and frustrated and focused on what's not right. And I can be filled with contention and strife and frustration. And and as I talk to people about their Christmas schedule, I hear a lot of both. There's a lot of things that we can praise God for. And there's a lot of things that we can complain about. And the shepherds, they went back to being homeless and living out in the field and taking care of sheep. This didn't change their status, but it changed their viewpoint. And I think as you and I look at the Christmas story and we see the miracle of God become flesh, that, that the word on your outline there, it says incarnation. And incarnation is a very graphic word It means that the invisible God was made flesh. And if that isn't graphic enough for you, let me tell you that carne is a word we still understand because you eat chili con carne. 
And that Spanish word is related to the Latin root, which says the invisible God became meat. And it was almost that graphic. And it's that big a miracle that the word became flesh. And he dwelled among us so that we can behold the glory of God. His life is eternal life and it's available to you and me. I'm gonna hand off to Pastor Sky and Pastor Will in Green and in South Umqua and you guys walk through these last bits with your congregations. Love you guys. This message comes differently to different people. Some people come to church on Christmas and you're not sure whether you really have a relationship with Christ. You're not sure that that life of eternal life is in you. And I think that one of the reasons that we study this story is to know that salvation is available to all. It's good news that will bring great joy to all the people. Every one of us needs a savior. We need a savior from our sins so that we can have a relationship with God. And if you're not positive that you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, if you don't understand that the incarnation of Jesus was as great a sacrifice as the cross. Let me say that again, because I don't think we get it. The incarnation, the coming to be a human being was as great a sacrifice as the cross. And you and I relate to nails being driven in your hand and your back being shredded, and, and we live in physical bodies, and to us, boy, we understand that was a huge sacrifice. You and I do not understand what going from a limitless power to being confined to a baby. We don't understand what that's like. But because of the incarnation and because of the sacrifice of Christ at the crucifixion and because of the resurrection, Jesus can be the Savior. And if you can learn to say, He is my Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. then you will have understood the message that the shepherds received. And you will have taken that and then God says you will live forever with him. That the reason Jesus, it says he was rich and he became poor so that we might become rich. That's exactly right. And if there's no other reason to rejoice at Christmas time, that should be reason enough. And it's not just the old story we've heard before. It's this is real. This is true. This is vital. And the God who is always working invisibly behind the scenes is still at work. And he's at work in your life, and he wants to be at work through you. Because just like the shepherds, the first response should be, let's go see. Let's check this out. Let's learn. Let's find out who this Lord Jesus Christ is. And then the next response should be, how can I go and tell? Because if you had a cure for cancer, let me tell you, you would be sharing it. And we've got better news than that. And so we want to give you a challenge. On your seat... There should have been this card that said Illuminate Christmas, and this is our Christmas Eve service, and we're having two services at four and at six o'clock, and we want to give you a chance to invite your neighbors. So here's some things that we've done over the last couple years, is make a plate of cookies, and then put your invitation on it and take it to your neighbors, you know those ones that you only talk to when you're out taking your trash out together? The, the ones that you maybe had a dispute over the boundaries, uh, the one that you... Uh, that you don't like the way they drive down your driveway? <laughs> yeah, those neighbors. What if you invite them to come with you? Because you'd be amazed at how many people are one invitation away from coming to church. Because it's scary to them and they need somebody to help walk them through it. And Christmas is a great time to do that. So I don't know what your sphere of influence is like but let's be like the shepherds. Let's go and see. Then let's go and tell. And then let's be praising and glorifying God for the work that he's doing, whether we can see it all the time or not. Let's pray. God, thank you for these very simple, basic stories that review for us again the things that we know in our heads to be true, but we don't always experience in our life. And Father, if there's anybody here today that has never experienced the life-transforming power of Jesus, I pray that the message they hear would be, let's go and see. That they would keep coming, that they would 
find out that you are the Lord, that you are Jesus, and that you are the Christ. And Father, for those of us who do know you, I pray that you would give us a passion and a compassion to tell people, whether we think they're going to get it or not, whether we think they're receptive or not, whether we think that they understand or not, that we become messengers, that we become the heralds that proclaim your birth, and that you can use us in the same way that you use the shepherds. And I was thinking how those shepherds 2,000 years ago could never have envisioned (laughs) that 2,000 years later, thousands of miles away, we would be talking about them. But God, their lives were changed forever. And thank you that you want to do the same with us. In Jesus' name, amen. We are so glad that you have joined us here at the Family Church service. And we trust that God is using the songs and the message to somehow challenge you and to help you take spiritual steps. If you'd like to be a part of our ongoing ministry, then we believe that giving is a part of what God has given us a responsibility and a privilege that we take a first part of what he's given to us and we, we give it back to him, both as a symbol that he owns everything and we acknowledge that, and also as a symbol of trust that, God, you're going to take care of me. And so there is on the webpage a place where you can give. And if you would like to be a part of what God is doing here and through this video around the world, that we would encourage you to give and trust that God will take care of you and trust that you want to be a part of what God is doing here. Thanks for joining us, and we hope you truly feel like family.